All right, so increasing utilization. Um, you know, if you have the technology, are you using it? Um, we hear a lot of people that have it. Um, a lot of people initially get it for DIBH breast. Um, that's kind of a, a common thing we hear, but why not use it for everything? Um, if you have it, um, why not use it? So um, I think it's important anytime um, you're starting a new process, getting a new technology, um, introducing anything, um, that you have a process. Um, it's kind of a common theme of my whole presentation. It's having a process, following the process, um, trying to get a process ahead of time. Um, that way, when you're in the stress of actually using the technology, you already know ahead of time the process that's going to happen. So these are kind of the three steps um, I suggest for um, not just if you already have the system, but also if you don't have the system and you're moving to the system, you can use this process in your clinic as well. Um, you may have to change it a little bit depending on your situation. Um, where I work, we have one machine. Um, we have several machines in um, our area that all use the same process and the same technology. Um, but you may have to tweak this a little bit if you have multiple machines or if you're very rural. Um, some of these things uh, may need to adjust. It's just important to have a process um, ahead of time and kind of discuss that as you're implementing all of this technology. So um, start with a champion. Um, I think Vision RT may call that person a super user. Um, I like the word champion. just think it sounds a little more exciting and fun. Um, and then begin with one or two types of treatments. Um, when you initially roll something out, you don't want to say, hey, we have this. Now we're going to use it on every single patient. Um, you know, I think that creates a little bit of stress. It can slow your schedule down. So try to just kind of select, if you're doing it on one um, treatment, try to select one, one more treatment um, to add it on. And then add the treatments one at a time. And then, um, so the champion. <clears throat> this is something I think is really important. Um, you may have heard some other people kind of talk. Um, when you begin, you wanna have one person drawing all their ROIs and one person importing. Um, I've heard it be physicist, therapist, um, lead therapist. It just kind of depends on your clinic um, and what's gonna work for you. Um, you can change who that person is as you go along, but in the beginning, one person should draw all of your ROIs and um, do all of the importing. This person um, should be available at the machine. Um, you wanna establish what their role is in the beginning and make sure they're able to provide support. Um, I think especially on, on the therapist side of it, we wanna make sure somebody is there to really help us so that it can go smoothly. And then um, again, start slow. Um, you know, you want to introduce these things um, one at a time and you wanna look at your patient pop population at the time. Um, you know, you don't wanna be starting DIBH on a 92 year old hard of hearing um, patient to start with. You really want it to be, um, you know, cherry pick those patients that you have. Try not to bunch a bunch of patients together at one time. Um, if you're going to start with right breast, try to have right breasts that are spread out throughout the day. Um, that way you're not using this kind of back to back and slowing your schedule down. It, it will take you a day or two um, to be able to pick up and run with it. Just try to give yourself that time. Don't um, overload yourself. Um, and then even though one person is going to be drawing the ROIs, I think it's really important just from the beginning um, to start that discussion of why you're placing the ROIs where you place them. Um, try to have the whole team there if you can, watching as um, the champion is drawing the ROIs and kind of talking through um, the process that you're using, why you're placing them there. Um, try to answer questions at that time if you can. And then um, adding multiple ROIs um, is something that I don't hear a lot of people use. Um, I think when you think of adding multiple ROIs, you think of using it on an arm and your chest wall and maybe a super clav. But I really suggest adding in temp ROIs to give people um, the opportunity to practice. So you'll have your champion that's going to draw um, a default ROI. And then you can add as many ROIs as you want um, in the import phase um, to a particular site. And then you can switch between them seamlessly during treatment. 
Um, for me, this is really how I advanced my ROI drawing skills. Um, you're able to look at all of your ROIs um, with the patient on the table, and if something's not working, you still have that ROI that your champion created. And if it's not, if the ROI you drew isn't working, then later when the patient isn't on the table, you can sit down and have a discussion on how yours looks different from what the champion drew and just be able to compare them without the patient being there and it affecting patient care. Um, so I just kind of included, is there a pointer on here? Yes. So um, in the record phase, this is where you would add your ROIs. Um, you can see here, you can have as many as you want. Um, it initially will name it default ROI, so this would be where your champion, um, whoever you designate, is going to draw ROIs. Um, then you can add these ROIs in, and you don't have to actually create an ROI. You can leave it blank if you want, um, or you can go ahead. Um, I've heard people name this. Each therapist on the machine can have their own ROI when they're learning to draw them. That way you can kind of look at Mary's ROI or Shelley's ROI and kind of compare it to um, the initial ROI. And I think that really helps build um, your confidence that you can create an ROI um, and still have something that you know is going to work. Um, I just think that really helped me and my partner um, learn to draw ROIs and then start recognizing when we're importing um, how the different patients' bodies need to be adjusted. And then in the treatment screen, um, you can just see here, you'll push play to start, and then um, you can switch between these without having to even pause. So you can toggle between your champion ROI and the ROI um, that you drew and kind of see how they compare, see how it changes on the patient. Um, I just think it's really helpful. And then just a little preview. <coughs> Um, this is version six. It's a little bit different. Um, you do it from the treatment screen. You can do it in prep, um, which is the new record. And then you have over here on your sidebar, and you can actually just add um, the ROIs um, very quickly on the fly. But same thing. We just go ahead and add these extra ROIs ahead of time um, and use them. And then in the treatment screen, um, same thing. You would just play and then um, toggle between them here. So I think this is um, something I hear a lot of people don't use, and I know for me this is really how I got to be an advanced ROI um, drawer and, and really helped um, kind of move my skills forward um, using my system. And so uh, this kind of last step in increasing um, utilization, um, once everybody is comfortable, once all the conversations have been had, what you're going to start, the patients that you're going to select, um, you know, make sure everybody is kind of on the same page. Again, consider those patients that are currently under treatment. Don't just say, hey, we're going to start on right breast and add it on all of the right breasts. Look at your patients. See who you know wouldn't mind if you spent an extra minute or two um, on their treatment. Um, patients that stay still, um, these types of things. And then just give everybody on the team... Um, the chance to have a voice and um, you know give their opinion, decide as a team. Um, you know, I know sometimes as therapists, when we have these types of processes, we're not necessarily given a choice. So I think it's important that um, you're able to think about it ahead of time, um, guide your physics and doctors on um, what you guys are comfortable with, um, and really try to have those conversations ahead of time. And then every time you're going to add a new treatment site, go through the same process. Um, you know, just repeat that same process that you started with um, and, and really just try to copy it. Once you've been successful with the process once, um, then you know you'll be successful with the process the second time. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about change management. Um, this is something not just in our field, but in every field, um, causes a lot of people angst. Um, in our role as therapists, we're not always involved in this process, and that can sometimes give us a little bit of anxiety, sometimes have some resentment in these types of things. Um, so I think if you can try to think of the change man management process um, kind of as a whole and then recognize um, what role we have in that process and how we can help the process, um, I think it's, it's really helpful. So 
the first step is assessing for change. Um, this is not always a step that we're included in. Sometimes it comes from admiss administration. Sometimes it comes from somebody going to a nice dinner with a rep. Um, you know, somebody along the line decides that um, we need to have a change or implement a new technology. Um, so again, sometimes we know this is happening, sometimes we don't. Um, this next step, prepare for change. This is usually when we become aware that something is happening. Um, sometimes our administration doesn't communicate to us. Sometimes we see people coming in and changing out computers. Um, we may see reps coming in and out, but we're not always aware of um, what's going on. So that can lead to some of the stress and anxiety of the process as well. Um, the planning for change. Um, sometimes we do get to be involved in this. We may go to training. We may have trainers come on site. Um, we may talk about the go live day, all of these types of things. Um, you know, we can have a say in. And then this implement the change. This is where we're really asked to come in and um, make things happen. Um, sometimes we're given an option or opinion, but most of the time we're not. Somebody comes in and says, here's your technology, now just make it work. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to help that process be um, smooth, how to embrace that process, um, and then kind of how to approach it as a team membership. And then sustaining the change, this is also something um, that really falls on our shoulders that we're really responsible for um, making happen. And then the success, you know, is where everybody wants to go. And again, that's something that we really um, are responsible for. Um, so anytime change management happens, I think it's un um, important to try to understand why the change happens. Um, a lot of times it's very stressful to think about, um, hey, this change is happening. It's going to slow me down. It's going to do this. But if you try to think about the end stage, letting go of those tattoos, being able to reduce our imaging, um, you know, shortening our treatment times, all of these things, if you can try to keep that in your mind and um, recognize that eventually you're going to get to a place where you're going to be able to increase your patient care um, and make it better for your patient. It makes it a little bit easier to deal with the stress and just kind of remember um, why you're doing it. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that um, change affects people differently. Um, you have people who get really excited about change. Um, they're going to be talking to the vendors, talking to the doctors, talking to the patients, and they kind of really get manic, um, which is great. Um, but then you also have people who need a couple of days um, to process. You know, they may need to really think about what's happening. They may quiet down in this situation. Um, they may withdraw a little bit. They may not want to um, volunteer as much. Um, so really try to recognize that there's a whole spectrum of how people accept change. Give everybody on your team um, the time and space they need to adjust. Um, just because somebody is a little bit quiet doesn't mean that they don't want the system or um, you know, are going to be hard to deal with. They just need a little bit of extra time. And same with those people who are really manic. Sometimes you're like, holy cow, can you just calm down a little? Um, you know, those people handle it in a different way too. So um, just try to remember when you're going through the process that everybody handles it a little bit differently. And then um, also acknowledge people learn at different speeds. Um, you know, some people need to see a process once or twice and they can go and run with it. Some people need to take a little bit more time. And sometimes the people that take a little bit longer, you know, may absorb um, some of the nuances. So try to be comfortable with everybody. If somebody needs a little bit of extra time, if you know you've got the system, you can do it in, after watching twice. Give your partner um, the chance to get on there. Be patient with them. Allow them the time they need to pick up the um, information and um, be comfortable with it. So the implementation phase is kind of where I'm starting um, in the change management, just because that's really when we have our time to shine um, and um, where we're given um, the system and really said, hey, just make it work. So. Um, I think it's important once we get to this phase that we try to get the information um, in as many different formats as we can. Um, people learn by hearing, seeing, or doing, um, or a combination of all of those things. Some people may need to have the user manual right next to the computer where they're reading and clicking and following. Um, 
try to allow that. Um, some people need to have their hands on it. Some people need to see it and hear you walk through the process. Um, so just try to give everybody on the team, um, try to recognize how different people learn and um, if they need different resources, um, try to get those there. And then again, I can't stress, this is a, a whole team approach. Um, one person in the department can really um, help this be successful and one person can really make this process more difficult. So try to give everybody um, on the team time um, if you think somebody is struggling, try to ask if there's something you can do to um, help in the process. Try to identify what their stressors are um, and try to address them. Don't just say, well, that's just cranky Sally. That's the way she is. Try to find out, um, you know, why um, she's having trouble. Um, give her the confidence to voice her opinion and her concerns. And then um, my physicist really likes to refer to these weekly meetings as a weekly Festivus meeting. Um, I think when you have this implementation process, it's really important to, ahead of time, schedule a weekly meeting that everybody on your team um, can go to. Make sure the physician's schedule is clear. Make sure you've scheduled room on your, your schedule. Don't fill it with SIMS or any patients. Know that this is a block of time that your whole team is going to sit um, and discuss what's working, what's not working, what do you want to change? What do you hate? What process needs to be improved? Um, and just go ahead and schedule these on, you know, I would suggest for the first month, have these meetings on um, that everybody can go to and continue to have the meetings until everybody's comfortable. So um, sustaining the change. Um, another thing my physicist loves to say is entropy will happen. People go on vacation, PRNs come in. Um, therapists rotate through. Um, you really want to have a plan from the implementation phase of how you're going to continue the process going forward. Um, so continue to use your champion. If you're just getting the system and you're rocking on your first treatment site, now it's time to do your second treatment site. You can change who the champion is. Um, you know, maybe you've identified somebody on the team. Give them the ability to build some leadership skills and be the champion. Um, for the next treatment site. Um, it just kind of gives um, you the onus and allows you to kind of um, be proud of something in the end. Um, mm -hmm. You're being asked to use this, maybe you don't have a choice, but you do have a choice on how successful um, you can make it and how you embrace it. And then build a training program. Um, I would really suggest kind of going through the same process with new employees and PRNs as you had going into the system. So make sure you have all the information um, in several formats. Make sure there's a champion or a designated trainer who can work with um, the new therapist when they come on and just kind of continue that process going forward. And then, of course, always discuss what you've done um, to improve patient care. Most therapists are um, in this field because we really want to help our cancer patients. We really care about... Um, what happens with them, and we really want the best for them possible. So really um, stay focused on patient care. Um, if something is going wrong, um, just make sure you remember the things that are going right at the same time. And so um, the last part is overcoming common learning curve barriers. Um, these are some common things I've heard when people um, come to my clinic and kind of talking um, with everybody um, that people have a hard time with um, and that can kind of restrict them from um, moving forward and using this treatment for every patient every time. Um, so I'm gonna go into detail about some of these. And again, if you have something specific that you want um, to talk about, please find me um, afterwards. So, um, Letting go of tattoos. Um, this is one of those things that almost everybody is like, what? We're not going to treat with tattoos anymore. Um, you know, we're been a therapist for 10 years. So that was like drilled into my head, tattoos and marks, tattoos and marks. Um, you know, I don't even know how many times I've had a patient get simmed, come to treatment, lost their marks, have to go back to sim, be remarked, um, re-simmed you know, all of these things. So I think letting go of tattoos gives a lot of people anxiety. Um, and I think it also kind of goes with the same thing of trusting your system. So I think, again, common theme of my presentation is have a process. 
Um, don't just say, okay, today we're stopping tattooing. Um, that's really scary and I don't suggest doing that. Um, if anything goes wrong, you're automatically going to think, oh my God, it's, I did this worst thing. I didn't tattoo and now I can't set my patient up. So, um, you know, have a process. I really suggest continuing your tattoos, put the patient on the table, line up to their tattoos, um, turn the system on and then leave the room, image the patient and see what your shifts are and do that for a period of time compared to the shifts um, that you're seeing on your SGRT system um, to the imaging system that you have and kind of com compare them. Um, then once you've kind of seen that comparison, flip it. When you go in the room, turn your system on, line the patient up to what vision says, go out of the room and image. Um, you may do more imaging in the beginning um, and once you become comfortable with it, You'll be able to let go of the tattoos. You'll be able to trust that your system works because you'll actually see, um, you know, those shifts. Um, you'll actually be able to see that. You'll see the data. Um, you can include that in your weekly meetings, um, you know, so everybody can be on the same page. I know at my center, it was the physician that really had a hard time. Um, the therapist really wanted, we were like, we're not even using the tattoos. The patients don't like to be tattooed. It's always the first thing they ask about when we walk them into SIM is what are my tattoos? Um, so it took him a little bit of time to say, okay, um, I'm reviewing images. You're not lining up to the tattoos. Everything is looking good. So let's try it. Um, if somebody on your team really doesn't want to let go and you're tattooing, maybe switch to just doing marks for a while with Tegaderm um, and use that as your intermediate step. Um, you just have to have a process um, in your clinic and for yourself to kind of build that confidence. Um, and then recognizing difficult body habitus. Um, this is another one we hear a lot of people say, um, I can now when I'm in SIM be able to say, this patient, I'm going to have to work my ROIs. I'm going to have to um, change things and do things a little bit different rather than the standard um, ROI that I would normally draw. And give yourself a little bit of extra time. You know, this patient may need to be in a 30-minute time slot to start instead of a 15-minute time slot, so you can really work those ROIs. Um, make sure you add in those multiple ROIs if you don't want to do it for every patient, especially these patients that um, you think is a difficult body habitus. And I would say... Anything that jiggles a whole lot um, is going to take you a couple extra minutes. Um, anything that you're treating in an area where there's um, a lot of adipose tissue, um, you're going to have to do a couple extra steps to really get a good ROI. Once you get that good ROI and you begin to recognize um, how you can place things um, and how the different bodies um, affect placing your ROIs, um, you'll really be able to run with it. And then drawing ROIs, that's another area um, people have a hard time with. And again, add those multiple ROIs in, in practice, be able to use them on a patient while you're treating, um, and just keep those original ROIs that um, your champions are using. So I just have a couple examples from um, my clinic. This one, for all those nerds, I call this the Eye of Sauron. Um, this is that type of patient that um, has a really solid belly, kind of a beer belly, um, maybe a super ascites type of patient. Um, and his belly was so big, this is because it was so close to the gantry that cameras couldn't see. So you're going to want to make sure your ROI is not on an area that's like that, because then you're asking the cameras to look at and extrapolate information from somewhere that they can't see. So if you see something like that, you just kind of need to know that you're going to need to adjust your ROI to not include that type of area. Um, this is another belly. Um, I should have included a lateral picture, but um, we just kind of shaved out. We went a little bit lower to be on her pubis. Um, she was a super belly breather. Um, and on this type of patient, when you draw an ROI and when you're setting the patient up, um, because when you move the table, the patient is going to jiggle a little, you kind of have to move the patient a little let that settle down, let the delta settle down, and then do your next movement. Um, you know, so just little movements at a time, letting the patient become still, watching your deltas, um, and just trying to get it on a solid area if you can. Um, this is a prone patient. It's kind of hard to see. Um, but with the prone patient, we really want to make sure we go way up the hip. Sometimes their back is um, really kind of flat the whole way. So you want to make sure you go down the sides, um, kind of get 
the top of their crack a little if you can, um, just to get grab some topography. Um, you know, you can even have them covered down here if they're uncomfortable. Some patients feel um, really vulnerable when they're on their belly, so you can have them covered here and just keep your ROI a little bit higher. Um, this is a patient, um, this was probably one of our harder setups. Um, we couldn't get an ROI that came down um, because her panis hung down so far. We really couldn't get it on a stable area. Um, so what we did was include part of this area um, on her panis and then a lot of her hip area. And then she was one of those that really moved the table a little, wait for everything to settle, move the table a little more, wait for everything to settle. A lot of times we had to pull her lateral on the table instead of moving her um, to the position. So, um, you know, we took a little couple, a couple extra minutes with her, but um, we were eventually able to get her set up um, really reproducible. reproducible. Um, <clears throat> this is another patient we had issues with. So this was our first kind of our traditional ROI for a um, super clock, um, but she was really didn't have a lot of um, topographical anatomy in this area, and we were having a consistent lawn shift every day. Um, so we changed our ROI to grab the um, bottom of the contralateral breast and also this area, and then we went up and included um, just kind of around the clavic clavicular heads and jugular notch and it completely eliminated the issue. So we were setting her up with this, um, Vision was giving us all green deltas we were imaging, and then we were having over a 0.3 um, lawn shift. Um, so we were trying to figure out what with our delta or what with our ROI was kind of causing that issue. Um, so we tried this, and it worked really well. And we've actually kind of used this on some of our um, other chest wall patients, um, and it's worked really well for us. So it's just kind of being comfortable with changing these ROIs when you need to. And these are just two examples of different breasts. Um, this one you can see um, is a little bit flatter. We kind of went up a little bit higher over a little bit farther. Um, this patient, um, we shaved off some of this area here and some of the area here over her diaphragm to eliminate some of the um, noisy deltas. And then this patient we treated, um, the head and neck patient, we only treated her with a chin strap. I don't know if you can... Um, see that. So this is our head and neck um, ROI that we would use. And in addition to that, we used um, this ROI across both of her shoulders. So we would line up to this ROI, um, get all of our deltas to look nice. We would switch, um, get our launch, um, move the shoulders into where we want them. And then we would switch back to this ROI, make sure it was still on, and then we'd leave the room to treat. Um, this was a similar type of patient, a little bit different. Um, this patient was in cardiac failure and her um, heart perfusion was so bad she couldn't lay flat. So we had to treat her on a breast incline. We did use um, the full brain mask. Um, she also had a trach and had to have um, oxygen over her trach. So we couldn't use the ROI that went all the way across. So instead we used three separate ROIs. We used this one, which was an isocenter ROI. And then these were um, centroid ROIs, and we used them individually to get each shoulder lined up. Once we got the shoulders lined up, we would then return to the original ROI, make sure that was still on, and then we'd leave the room and treat. And so that's it. I know I might have gone over in time. Um, so if there's any questions, I do also want to mention, I'm sure everybody is aware of this. Um, this is a forum that is really for us. It's, um, you know, our community. If you have questions or, you know, on the flip side of that, if you discover something in your clinic that you think you're doing really well, please go on here and post it. Um, I've heard a lot of people, especially um, machines that are in rural communities, they really use this and rely on it. Um, so I think it's a really good um, tool for us um, to not just, if you're having a problem look, but then also post the things that um, you're doing really well so that other people can learn from it. Um, I love radiation therapy because it's a community. Um, and I really love vision because they really do um, care about therapists. I meant to mention this in the beginning, but um, they 
I think a lot of times some of this stuff is marketed more towards our physicians and our physics team. And um, vision really cares on our level, how it's affecting us, not just that it's effective, but that the usability is easy for us, that we enjoy using their product. Um, so if you are having an issue, please reach out to them. Even if you have OSMS, um, they're, they're really, really good at helping. Um, I can't say enough about um, you know, what they've taught me and really given me um, the skills um, and the confidence to really move my patient care forward. So hope you learned something. And um, again, if you have any questions, just give me after. So, thank you.